BBC Radio Six Music Documentaries. Now, Van the Man. Hello, I'm Marianne Faithful. Welcome to Van the Man, our program on one of the great singer-songwriters of the last 35 years, Van Morrison. You've been listening to Turn Your Radio On by Lead Belly, one of the many black musicians heard in the young Van's home in 50s Belfast. Van's father, George, a shipyard worker, had an extensive collection of jazz and blues records, and it wasn't long before this musical environment encouraged Van to form his own band. Neighbor Gil Irvine was a member of this kid's group. The band was called the Sputniks. Well, it wasn't really a band. It was uh, a kid's skiffle group, you know, aged between 10 and 12. Typical of the era, we played usual instruments, you know, guitars, washboard, tea chest bass. Uh, but we were a wee bit special. We had a, an instrument called the Zobo, which we in, inherited. Uh, I don't know whether it was Van or Van's dad actually named the instrument. Basically what it was, it was a steel pipe played like a, a didgeridoo to try and get a bit more bass end on it. Uh, playing places like uh, school concerts, playing Saturday matinees at cinemas, you know, between the B-movie and the big picture sort of thing. That was a good gig in those days, so it was. Uh, playing stuff like... Uh, Lonnie Donegan's Rock Island Line. Oh, well, the Rock Island Line, the Shinna Mighty Good Road. The Rock Island Line is a road to ride it. The Rock Island Line, the Shinna Mighty Good Road. And if you want to ride, you got to ride it like a fine. You get your ticket at the station on the Rock Island Line. The track on Hindford Street just brings the hairs up in the back of my neck uh, simply because it evokes a whole period of time uh, around the late 50s, early 60s, where he seems to have encapsulated uh, summer holidays into a few minutes on, on, a, on a song. Uh, such memories as uh, going stealing people's apples on North Road Bridge, you know, <laughs> which we shouldn't do. Uh, going to places like Rockport on the bikes and going up Craigie Glen. Uh, this was all pre-Troubles, so it was. So you could do these things, you could move from area to area. It was a very peaceful time. Uh, it was so peaceful that Sunday nights, the, the, the whole world seemed to close at 11 o'clock or something like that, maybe earlier. Uh, but it was just, uh, the song itself just brings back a whole lot of memories. Take me back. Take me way, way, way back. On Hindford Street, where you could feel the silence at half past eleven on long summer nights. As the wireless played Radio Luxembourg and the voices whispered across Beachy River. Quietness as we sank into restful slumber in the silence and carried on dreaming in God. It walks up Cherry Valley from North Road Bridge, railway line on sunny summer afternoons. Picking apples from the side of the tracks that spilled over from the gardens of the houses on Cypress Avenue. Watching the moth catcher work the floodlights in the evenings and meeting down by the pylons. Playing round Mrs. Kelly's lamp, going out to Hollywood on the bus and walking from the end of the lines to the seaside. Stopping at Fusco's for ice cream in the days before rock and roll. Hindford Street, the Better Parade, Orange Field, St. Donard's Church, Sunday Six Bells. And in between the silence there was conversation and laughter and music and singing and shivers up the back of the neck. And tuning into Luxembourg late at night and jazz and blues records during the day. Also Debussy on the third program, early mornings when contemplation was best.
Going up the Castlereagh Hills and the Craigie Glens in summer and coming back to Hindford Street, feeling wondrous and lit up inside with a sense of everlasting life. And reading Mr. Jelly Roll and Big Bill Brinsey and Really the Blues by Ms. Mesro and Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac over and over again. And voices echoing late at night over Beachy River. And it's always being nigh. And it's always being nigh. It's always nigh. Can you feel the silence? After leaving school, Van had several jobs, including apprentice fitter and window cleaner. But it wasn't long before he became a saxophonist in the Monarchs show band led by George Jones. He just appeared totally out of the blue and Aloni only lived about two or three streets away and I said uh, bro my guitar and I want to play music with you and we said fine and of course at that stage we didn't know what direction we were going we're still learning chords uh, we couldn't afford obviously to go to music lessons none of us could but Van was the type of uh, lad I think that picked everything up like ourselves by ear and possibly picked it up a lot quicker than anyone else he, as we found out later on in, in the ongoing years, he was very adept at picking instruments up, playing them, not brilliantly, but adequately. In other words, he could have got a, a three-chord progression out of a guitar that made it sound bluesy, even though he wasn't a great guitar player. And the same thing applied to harmonica. And uh, one instrument which he's probably well known for now was a saxophone. And the very funny story about the saxophone, how it appeared, we were sort of struggling, learning to play tunes together on guitars, and Van was bringing around his father's influences of his record collection, which was a jazz and blues collection, one of the best in Ireland. But he was telling us all about these guys like Ray Charles and, and Bo Diddley and Muddy Waters and all the great blues singers. And, of course, in those days, we didn't have any clue. We, were just, we had just left Lonnie Donegan behind and all, all the pop singers of the period uh, but we started getting into instrumental music uh, I suppose via the shadows and other American groups and one man who was a great influence to many guitar players was Dwayne Eddy but Dwayne Eddy seemed to mix all the time a full brass section with his instruments and one night out of the blue Van appeared with this case we hadn't a clue what it was, it was a long shaped case and at that stage we were practicing in the back of uh, my father's old furniture van right, with a cable strung in through the window to give us a bit of power for one amplifier and three guitars and I, I said what's that in the case, he says it's a saxophone my daddy got me, my dad got me a saxophone and I said can you play it she says yeah I think I know one note and we worked out what the note was and the note turned out to be a bottom and F. And what we had been practicing for the last two or three days was Peter Gunn, which was a big hit for Dwayne Eddy, the theme from Peter Gunn. And it went on the guitar something like this. It went. And then it started like that on the guitars. Drums come in, then the bass come in. But the thing that we could never capture was a big brass chord. Ba bow. And I said, well, if you can blow a bottom F, we play Peter Gunn and F. And we started. Right for him play, and he went. Bah, bah. After a period in Scotland, the monarchs went down to London to make it in the big time. Two German agents came and seen about ten bands. We did our own rock and roll set, which we were very proud of, which we all leapt about, including Van, and rolling about, and throwing the saxophones up in the air. And of course, the Germans thought this was wonderful. We got it booked immediately. And within one month of starving, we were the only English-speaking band to arrive in Heidelberg, the same time as the Beatles were in Hamburg. That was 1961, 62. And from that moment on, the Monarchs became the International Monarchs. It was a six-piece with Van and saxophone. Uh, we were playing what we thought was pure blues and rock and roll from America. 
and wowing them in Heidelberg, which was the southern sector of Germany. It was different than where the Beatles were. It was a British sector. We were down still in the American sector. And then we went further north to Cologne. And it was at that point that we met this guy in the middle of a set in the, the Storyville Jazz Club in Cologne. Guy walked in and he honestly looked like we were all young lads. We were all about 17, 18. He looked like Dracula. He had this huge cloak on with a big, you know, sinister collar on it. And at the end of the set, he sort of pointed to me and waved me over. He says, I want to to record a song for me. And true enough, about two days later he arrived with this music manuscript with these two songs which were to be an A and B side. And this guy turned out to be Roland Kovacs who was second in command of all CBS of all of Germany, right? It produced a single which was Georgie and the Monarchs. And I think on the A side at one stage in the middle of a solo, I shout out and say, take it Van. And Van takes a solo in the middle of it. Now, if you look back on the records of any of Van's uh, bibliography or his disc discography, you'll find that that's the first record that he ever recorded or played on. It turned out to be two of the corniest pieces of music that you ever heard. But the guy was paying us, so we went ahead and did it. And the A side was called Boozoo, Holly Gully. And that was the only thing that was creative. The title are different. <laughs> It was when Van returned to Belfast that he formed the rhythm and blues band Them. Billy Harrison was the lead guitarist. Started off as a three piece group, the Gamblers, myself. Ronnie Mullings on drums, Alan Henderson on bass. Then we added keyboards with Eric Rickson, and finally Van came in as a saxophone player. We were sitting rehearsing one night and tossed about the idea of a new name. Was Eric came up with the idea of them, so that was it. That was the formation of them, and uh, then three guys, which obviously everybody has heard of, that knows the, the story of that, the three J's. <laughs> to three Jerry's, uh, they came along and asked us would we like to play in the Maritime Hotel, which had run a traditional jazz night on Fridays, which was ending. They were going to take over the running of shows in it and try and turn it into a blues thing, which was just beginning to start up then, you know, late 63, early 64. So uh, we agreed and we went along and the first night there were probably 30 or 40 people there and the next week there were maybe a hundred or so and the third week we had to close the doors because they were queuing up outside to get in and the thing just exploded and escalated we were the only people playing anything like that late 64 uh, Baby Please Don't Go was released the first record Don't Start Crying Now had died to death but Baby Please Don't Go started moving Ready Steady Go decided to use it as a signature tune. They said to be played for six weeks. It ended up running 13. And New Year's Eve, 64, Baby Please Don't Go came into the charts, I think it was about 47 or something like that, in the top 50. Decca. Their agents here were Solomon in Paris. Phil Solomons had brought Bert Burns over from America. Very, very good producer. Very nice guy, Bert. Uh, and he had this song called Here Comes the Night. We come up with a version that we recorded and stormed up the charts to number two. After the breakup of the original Them, Van put together a new band with a different sound. Jim Armstrong was the new guitarist. The original band was straight R&B. Um, Van wanted a more jazzy approach, and we had a guy called Ray Elliott who was a super player, saxophone, flute, vibes, piano. So it took on that sort of. We were carrying vibes on stage. I played more jazzy, so you know we were doing like Stormy Monday with all the chords rather than three chords, stuff like, you know, nice. So that's the direction he was wanting to go in. 
the management were too fussed. <laughs> When we went to the States, it was really funny. We played um, we played Hawaii, and the first night we went on and played, I thought it was a good set. I was, we were quite happy with the music. And the guy came up, the promoter accused us of being drunk, <laughs> which we weren't. So the next night we got drunk. And Van fell into the drums and danced about. And the guy came up and says, that's what I wanted last night. Let's go walking. Where the boats go by. While performing at the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles, Van met another Morrison. The Doors played the final week and a half or something like that. Support. Um, they had no record deal at the time. They were just, but they were doing all the stuff that they're famous for. They had joined us in the last night. We all played Gloria, in the very last number, you know, sort of 20 minute version of Gloria. And the Doors of there has been a version of the doors doing that. Two very different backgrounds. I mean, band from Belfast and our upbringing and, and uh, Jim Morrison's upbringing in California. I mean, the California was the dope and was the, the time of all that. And we were drinkers. That was our sort of upbringing, you know. We taught him to drink. I think we he came round. He came round our apartment several times and started drinking and wrecked a room in the hotel. <laughs> Van and uh, Jim were thrown out of the Whiskey Go Go later on. Um, I mean, they played during that tour. Um, Van and Jim went up to see Johnny Rivers and finished up dancing on tables and shout, hurling abuse at Johnny Rivers and were thrown out. <laughs> so, I mean, they had it off, I suppose, you know. <laughs> After the American tour, them finally dissolved and Van returned home to Belfast. Although he felt the band had been exploited and the original vision compromised, he was still determined to succeed. He put together a tape which found its way to Burt Burns in the States. This led to Van cutting several singles for Bang Records, including his first solo hit, Brown Eyed Girl. Despite chart success, Van was dissatisfied. He wanted to create an individual sound, but Bang were more interested in production line hits. After Burt Burns' untimely death in 1967, he fulfilled his contract by writing a statutory number of short songs. Having settled in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his girlfriend, Janet Planet, he played local dates with an acoustic trio which formed the basis of the sound for his first album for Warner Brothers, Astral Weeks. Tom Kilbania was the bass player, but didn't get to play on the album. They had a limited budget and they had so much, they just didn't want to take the time to, to mess around with people that didn't have a lot of experience in the studio. So they got some real heavy, heavy, heavy hitting jazz musicians. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed that because Richard Davis was playing bass. And I showed him uh, some of the bass lines I was playing. 
you know, in the, in the songs and stuff. So he kind of played around the lines that I had been playing when we were when we were playing out, and I, that, that was just just a fantastic thing to be in that studio and watching those people play. I mean, it was like an eight-hour jam, and they just cut out all the stuff they didn't want. <laughs> it was really nice. It was unbelievable. About two weeks later, they had a, an arranger came in and listened to all the stuff, arranged everything, and they went into the studio. They had all the charts were all written out. They they ran everything down once, and then they just recorded the whole thing all in one shot in about two and a half hours. They had put the whole thing together, all the all the background instruments. It was really professional. John Payne, the flautist in Van's trio, was more fortunate. I was just dying in the control room because I wanted to be out there. Because I, I mean, the guitar player was great, and the and uh, the vice player was great, and it sounded great what was happening. And uh, the flute player, I had to admit, even sounded good, but it was driving me crazy because I wanted to be out there. Oh, and I was too young to think that I should keep my place. You know, I was young and headstrong, and I kept saying to Lou Marenstein, the producer, "Oh, I could do that." And he's like. You know, you know, yeah, 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 right, right. You know, and so they put down a number of um, songs, and they were really about ready to quit for the night. And they said, "Well, you want to do one more?" And they go, "Yeah, let's just do one more." And um, they decided to do Astral Weeks, which I'm pretty sure was not originally intended to be on the album. I'm not sure of that, but the, the producer turned to me and said, "You know, you want to try playing flute on this one?" And so I said, "Sure." Martin McLoon, now a lecturer at the University of Ulster, was a student in Dublin when the album first came out. I first heard Astral Weeks um, in the flat that I stayed in right at the beginning of my university career. Um, somebody in one of the flats upstairs had it, and uh, the music was just, just I mean, it just blew my mind away. I said, this is it, this, I've got to get this. And uh, it, it was Morrison's first solo album, and I guess the very first album that I got so reg uh, made such a register with that it stayed with me for the rest of my life. The thrill, I think, of hearing Dublin, Sandy Row, um, Belfast, um, name-checked in that space that all uh, in rock music is always reserved for Route 66 and all those uh, towns across it. This was a great thrill. Uh, suddenly here was Northern Ireland, here was my environment being taken out into the centre of rock music in, in a way that uh, was very different from us at the peripheral, always hearing Memphis, Tennessee being mentioned or whatever. It was a space opened up in a way that no other rock music had ever done before. It's in, in some ways Val Morrison's uh, Citizen Kane, you know. Even for experienced guitarist Jay Berliner, it was a memorable occasion. I remember Van Morrison came in, uh, who I d didn't know at all, of, of course, uh, the first time I'd ever seen him, and he they put him in a vocal booth, and uh, I remember, I, I don't know what he if he was smoking or what, but you couldn't, after a while you couldn't see him in the booth. I just saw smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was going on. But when we got started on Astral Weeks, it, it was just freewheeling. It, it just got started and we just kept going and, and going and, and it, it got pretty wild. It got pretty, very passionate and uh, it, it, was, it, it became almost, uh, almost primitive in, in some respects. It, the, the, it, and and when when it was uh, when we'd finished these takes, uh, the, the, the producer was, they were going crazy. The producer was going crazy. He said, "Man, you look, this is unbelievable. You know, you, you played your your blank off, and and uh, this this is utterly remarkable. And that do we have it on tape? Make sure, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing." Rolling Stone magazine had, had referred to it as one of the four or five most influential rock and roll albums in in, in, the, in history. And uh, when you think about it, it's far more than a rock and roll album because you have all kinds of influences in, in there. There's certainly a, a folk influence. Certainly, when Van plays the guitar, he, he plays. Uh, he has the head of a folk guitarist when he plays. Uh, his singing is uh, is unique. I, I don't know even how you would categorize that. And uh, and he had surrounded himself with basically jazz musicians, and uh, we were we were playing. Uh, we were imp imp highly, it was highly improvised music, and uh, because uh, it was so free, it, it, uh, we really just went where the music was going to go. The way you hear it on the record is the way it happened. And it, this was not edited. This was not a series of takes. It was just, it was just. In February 1969, Van and Janet, who are now married, moved to Woodstock in upstate New York. 
Van wanted to form a new band for Moondance, which was to become his first million-selling album. Long-time associate guitarist John Platania remembers Van's determination to employ new musicians and a different sound. His executive producer, Louis Marenstein, wanted other personnel. Marenstein wanted another band. He wanted a lot of the musicians from Astral Weeks in there. And he wanted me, and he fought for me, and he fought for the Call of Linfield Blues Band. He was taken on a song-to-song basis, and that was it. You know, a lot of it was done live, but I think, you know, Into the Mystic was, uh, you know, one of the highlights of that album. It's grown on me, and all those, the, the mood, the feeling, the lyrics, you know, uh, the sounds. I mean, sax players coming up with the sound that they did through a Leslie. I mean, it was some great approaches. Uh, uh, Shriner, Elliot, who was the engineer, did some great, great things. Let's A fantabulous night of making romance Do the cover of October skies All the leaves on the trees are falling To the sound of the breezes that blow And I'm trying to place to the calling Of your heartstrings that play soft and low In all the night And all the soft one light seems to shine in your place. Can I just have one more moon dance with you, oh my love? Or can I just make some more romance with you, oh my love? One more moon dance with you. Van's next album, his band and the street choir, contained the top ten hit Domino. But Van has always underplayed its quality. You know, it tends to be contrary. If people jump on that, he'll tend to minimize it. Even though I think deep down inside, you know, I think it's a strong album. He knows it. I mean, how can he deny it? And, you know, he doesn't really deny it. It's just that that's the way he is. He just wants to... Uh, he just wants to minimize his accomplishments and move on. What he's doing now, what he's, what's coming up is what is important to Van. So, I mean, he just, he just doesn't want anybody to dwell on, uh, uh, you know, on, on his accomplishments or his, crea- his creations, because he doesn't. That album was a bit more uh, produced in that it wasn't as done in a live setting uh, where everybody played at once. I mean, it was... I mean, a substantial number of musicians played a, a, on a basic track, but I remember doing a, a lot of my guitar overdubs later on after the, uh, the basics. And, you know, his approach to me was just play. I mean, he never directed me or anything. I mean, uh, he, yeah. which I really appreciated that he had the confidence to let me play what I felt. You know, every so often he said, don't step on my vocals. <laughs> that was it. That was the only direction. <laughs> You know, again, you know, uh, other than some comical moments where he would fire the band and rehire them again, I mean, it was really, <laughs> it was quite smooth. For, for whatever reason, he would get upset about something and just sort of fire everybody and then rehire them the next day.
1971, Van Janet and his daughter Shana moved to Marin County on the west coast of America. It was an intense period, with Van not only having to change his band, but also deliver two albums a year plus singles. This didn't stop his restless experimentation in his album St. Dominic's Preview. Martin McLoon. Morrison has often, like a lot of rock artists, Bob Dylan, one thinks of immediately, been compared to a poet who, who plays music, but essentially is a poet, as it were, who uses music as a, as a way of um, getting the message across. I've never been convinced to the extent that I, th- that I think the emphasis in Morrison's work is on lyrics and on words. They are important, but in fact, Morrison takes it in a way that somebody like Dylan doesn't, where the voice actually becomes an instrument in itself. And the words then become mere vehicles for something else. And it's the incantatory quality of Morrison's voice. Um, It probably reaches his zenith in an album like St. Dominic's Preview, where he will repeat a, a phrase over and over again until the phrase begins to take on some kind of greater meaning. There is a magnificent example of Morris's voice, Listen to the Lion, which is, for me, one of the great tracks of, of, of that period of Morrison. But in Listen to the Lion, the voice then gets raised to become another instrument, as well as the instruments that are there in the background. The voice becomes the extra instrument, and he encants over and over again key phrases to make it part of the, the mood piece that he's creating. For the lion... In 1973, while undergoing divorce proceedings, Van recorded Hard Nose the Highway in his own studio. 
After a return to his Irish roots with Veed and Fleece in 74, Van didn't produce another album till 1977, when promoter Harvey Goldsmith was his manager and linked him up with the charismatic New Orleans keyboard player Mac Rebenack, alias Dr. John. The two of them got on famously. Uh, one grunted and the other one talked a language that no one could understand, so they really <laughs> communicated well and eventually became very good friends. And then Van decided that he felt comfortable with this. He wanted to have a kind of New Orleans feel. He, was, he wanted to have a jazz feel to the music, a soul feel to it. And eventually um, uh, Van put a band together brought them all over to England and uh, we went up to Oxford, to Kidlington, to Richard Branson's studio, uh, the townhouse, and parked ourselves there and he started working on the album. And out of it came a record called A Period of Transition. To me, the period of transition was him really resurrecting himself and coming back into the industry. He'd gone through this whole hoop of drying himself out and whatever, and was back in the business and trying out a new life, so it fitted rather well. And then the next thing that happened was um, that Robbie Robertson called Van up and started to describe to him this idea he had for the band's last concert, and it was going to be called The Last Waltz. The whole thing took place in, in the Fillmore in, in uh, San Francisco, and it was quite an evening, and turned out to be a very memorable night for Van, A, because he played two pieces of music that just knocked the spots off everybody. I mean, he just went out and killed. And B, because five minutes before he was due to go on, he panicked, decided to go back to the hotel and change, just did a disappearing act. And I shot off after him, went back to the hotel, and he changed into the tightest leather jacket. I mean, he had put on a little bit of weight before that point, and he changed into this very tight leather jacket and trousers because he felt uncomfortable with what he was wearing. Neil Diamond was on before him, and there was and Joni Mitchell. And we, I said, come on, we've got to get back, we've got to get back. And we rushed back to the theatre and standing in the wings and finally he literally he was just about got his breath back and they went and ladies and gentlemen van morrison and he stood there and froze and i literally had to kick him out onto the stage and if you look carefully at the film you'll see my foot <laughs> coming out
In the 1980s, Van developed a more contemplative spiritual music with a strong poetic sensibility. The poet and critic Tom Paulin. I always associate him with the um, great um, American action painter Jackson Pollock, who um, came out of uh, the same Scotch-Irish uh, roots as uh, as Van does. And uh, it is the sense that this is an imagination which owes a lot to, to Calvinism. Um, Jackson Pollock said, I don't paint nature, I am nature. And I feel with uh, listening to Van, you're inside a natural process. So it's something that's not, not composed from the outside, not formed and, and shaped, but it shapes itself from the inside. But it's endlessly in process. Like, like Blake, he, he comes out of the working class, he comes out of... Um, uh, not traditional Protestantism uh, or uh, evangelical pr Protestantism. Uh, that, that that's the the foundation of his imagination, and he's testifying, um, I think, to the idea of uh, a much more generous society. So there is this extraordinary sense of uh, love in the poems, I think, um, and, and and tenderness for all sorts of things. To the energetically optimistic sense of what a possible future would be. Rise and look out. His chains are loose His dungeon doors are And children return from the oppressor's sword. They look behind at every step and believe, and believe it is a dream. Sing it, the sun has left its blackness. And found a fresher morning And yeah, the fair moon rejoicing In the clear and cloudless night For the empire is no more And now the lion and wolf shall cease Derek Bell recalls how Van and the Chieftains got together to make Irish Heartbeat in 1988. He invited me over to Loughborough University to lecture on the mystic side of music. And that took place. I met him there and he seemed to be in good form. And it was some time after that that he got the hold of Paddy and the idea gelled that we would make a record. And sure enough, we did. There were a certain number of tracks on the record we did with them. For instance, where you have a simple pentatonic Irish folk tune, such as Raglan Road. That is a folk tune, it was Kavanaugh only wrote the words. So the melody itself is as old as the hills and is really folk. And also other numbers like My Lag and Love and, and even Carrick Fergus. Now, when we produced the final result with him, there were many elements of, of rock music in those two very Irish tunes. And I think that's characteristic of having a merger with somebody that you don't destroy all the rock elements that are in him and he doesn't destroy all the Irish elements that we would have. I give her the gifts Shiny black hair like the clouds over 
from me, away from me so hurriedly And my reason, my reason, my reason, my reason must allow That I would not as I should A creature made of clay When the angel woos are the clay He loose his wings at the dawn of the day Around the same time as Irish Heartbeat, Neil Drinkwater was both Van's musical director and keyboard player. He made a significant contribution to the spiritually questing albums of that period and into the early 90s. The first album he played on was Poetic Champions Compose. I had no idea what to expect. Turning up at the studio, I didn't know if Van would already have songs written in in vir you know virtually finished format or that we would just go in and re-record or play but basically he's none, nothing was in uh, was finished at all and some of it wasn't started uh, lyrically he had lots of uh, ideas and uh, i mean which were his we never, none of us ever had anything to do with that um and uh, I mean, Celtic Excavation was the first track that I, I recorded with him and we, we did that more or less the first, I think it was the first day and maybe a couple of other things as well, but... Um, yeah, it was... Um, well, Celtic Excavation is really a blues without any, any sevenths and uh, it, uh, I mean, largely just improvised. Whenever God Shines His Light on Avalon Sunset was uh, all done in a day, finished. Um, there's no other instruments on it apart from bass and drums. The rest of it's all keyboard overdubs. And we did it one morning. Actually, this is quite an interesting story. We did it one morning and uh, we'd been talking the day before about possibly getting Miles Davis down to play a solo and Van had uh, checked it all out and Miles wanted ri something ridiculous money and Van actually said, well, what if I don't like it? So we decided against that. But the following day we recorded uh, Whenever God Shines His Light and uh, by the end of the day all the keyboard overdubs were done, the track was finished and uh, Van just suggested Cliff, you know, what about a duet with Cliff? And I think Cliff came in a few days later and... Uh, He'd been sent a tape and he was very pro. He just had everything down. He just came in and did it, backing vocals, and, and that was that. Very quick. Yeah. He was all rehearsed up. Yeah. Whenever God shine a light on me, open up my eyes so I can see. When I look up in the darkest night, I know everything is gonna be all right. In deep confusion, in great despair, when I reach out for him, he is there. When I am lonely as I can be, and I know that God shines his light on me. I remember recording hymns to the silence with Eddie Eddie Friel on organ because uh, that worked quite well. I enjoyed that. Sometimes it's difficult when you you've got two m melody instruments, uh, like guitar and piano, and or piano and organ, because of the danger of getting in each other's way when you you're not you don't actually have parts worked out beforehand. I mean that's an intuitive listening 
process and involves eye contact and some people do it and some people don't you know some people will give each other space and some won't they'll just play through you know uh, and when it when it's improvised as i say there's a lot of improvisation going on in in making the the backing to the songs um very often you can come away and listen back to it and you can see areas where you could have improved it or played less played more or changed it in some way and uh, but that's one of the things that, that I come away with and think no that's right that's all right and uh, there's an element of luck there really when you're recording it in that way if it all comes out right but that's part of of uh, I think the attraction a lot of people have for uh, for Van and his music really because it's spontaneous then there is such even in the recordings you're going for a vibe well, I did. Well, I did. In 1996, Van Morrison was awarded the OBE for his contribution to music. It was richly deserved. Few artists in the industry have survived for so long with such a prolific and consistent output, while richly exploring so many musical genres. A private man who hates interviews and publicity, he says he regards his work as just a job. However, to many of his fans, his songs have a very strong personal resonance. For instance, John McCarthy was sustained by Van's music while held hostage. As an acknowledgement of his influence and inspiration, various artists paid tribute to Van in the 1994 album No Prima Donna. I was one of them, and Van himself produced my recording of his great, great song, Madam George. Down the Cypress Avenue With childlike visions leaping into view Clicking, clacking of the high-heeled shoe Ford and Fitzroy, Madam George Marching with the soldier boy behind He's much older now With hat on, drinking wine and that smell of sweet perfume comes drifting through Early cool night air like Shalimar Van the Man was written with the assistance of Steve Turner and produced in Belfast by Roland Jacarello. Dry your eyes for Madame Jean Down home in the back street In the back street Say goodbye, say goodbye to me.